We are going to be going over cancer screening, PAPs, mammos, and ovaries. I have no disclosures. Well, actually, I do have one disclosure. My disclosure is when I looked at the PAP data, I was a little overwhelmed, so I put the slide in, and I'm going to trip over it a little bit. I know I am, but I am going to try to explain it as best I can. That's my disclosure. So basically, we're going to review the PAP screening. We're going to look at the mammogram screening. Um, the PAP screening is actually a little bit more straightforward, believe it or not, even after all the turmoil of the last few years. The mammogram screening, screening is every which way uh, but loose. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the pitfalls and potentials of ovarian cancer screening. Uh, and we're going to talk about speaking to recognized women who are high risk and referring them, and then if they come to you, and how to counsel them. PAP guidelines, the ASCCP, ACOG, the, the Preventative Task Force, Cancer Society, Cancer Institute, and Society for GY and Onc, believe it or not, they actually agree for the most part. So very busy slide. But basically, we all know this pretty well, right? Less than 21, we shouldn't be screening anybody. Remember, screening and diagnosing are different things. So if you have somebody less than 21 with an abnormal-looking cervix, with abnormal bleeding, postcoital bleeding, then we want to do a pap smear. At that point, it's not a screening test. It's a diagnostic test. 21 to 29, cytology every year, every three years, they, it's interesting because I think at some point they're going to make the 21 to 24 year old group different than the 25 to 29 year old group because there's higher pathology in the 25 to 29 year old group. So even though they are grouped together, in your mind you have to kind of treat them a little bit differently and I'll go over some of that data hopefully well so that you can understand that. Now, what's interesting is the guidelines actually say between 21 and 24, you don't even have to send a reflex if you have an ASCUS PAP. You can just repeat it, and we'll go over that in a minute. But after the age of 24, they do recommend reflex testing. From age 30 to 65, your options are to do just cytology every three years or to do cytology and HPV every five years. Uh, that's pretty standard. I think eventually they're going to move away even from a lot of the cytology, and, and we'll go over some of the, the problems that that may lead to. After 65, they recommend no screening at all. Um, unless somebody's had CIN2 or above, it has to, you have to continue screening for up to 20 years. And there are other little caveats to that as well. Age 25 to 65, ASCCP and I think SGO, that's on my next slide, they do have recommendations for primary HPV testing every three years. We actually don't do cytology at all. You do a primary HPV, and if that's positive, you do a reflex cytology. So it's, it's exactly opposite of what we're used to. Um, and again, that has some pitfalls. If somebody's had a hysterectomy and has no cervix, then they don't have to have screening at all, regardless of age, as long as they have had no abnormal pap CIN2, CIN2 or above for, for 20 years. So it's really helpful if you have their pathology. So if you have a patient new to you, it's really helpful to have their, their hysterectomy pathology. Um, people tend to not. I would think you'd remember an abnormal pap smear, but people tend not to remember, I think, um, very frequently. If somebody has been HPV vaccinated, they still follow the same screening guidelines. So even if somebody has HPV and over the next several years as our HPV um, vaccine starts to show, it starts to be more prevalent, then I think we're going to see some changes to that. But for right now, we continue the, the routine screening. Where do these guidelines disagree? Well, most of the time it's in wording. And the wording is instead of saying, you know, should not be performed, kind of recommend against, it's kind of loose wording that some of the different societies say, but those aren't major changes. 
Um, the US task force and ACOG are still pushing for that annual exam. You know, very slowly they're trying to get us. We don't have to do PAPS, we don't have to do pelvics, we don't have to do, you know, anything. I don't know how we're gonna get the patients to actually come into the office. Um, but ACOG is still trying to reinforce that we see people annually, even though the PAPS aren't annually. And it's only SGO and ASCCP that have the recommendations for the primary HPV screening, and that would be every three years. So we talked about this, I remember, last year, um, I think. I don't know if anybody's brought up this app, but this is yet another app, which is really helpful. I'm gonna try to do this in the left hand and this in the right hand like other people do. This may not go well, but I'm gonna try. Um, where they actually just put your screening guidelines, and they actually do, it's very interesting. Last night I was trying to read again their primary HPV screening. When I wrote this lecture a couple months ago, if you clicked on primary HPV screening, they actually show the algorithm that I'm gonna show in a couple screens. When I clicked on it last night, they didn't have an algorithm, but they redirected you to like a 57-page complex article about primary HPV screening. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, it's also a good um, <coughs> app, we'll go over it. So say you have a 23-year-old who comes to your office with no prior screening and you can't remember, was it 21, was it 23, was it 24? You can hit your, all right, I'm gonna try this. You can hit your um, screening. It will come up to, she's 21 to 29, so you hit there and right there. It says HPV testing should not be used for screening in this group. HPV triage is acceptable, just like we said before. So it says, yes, you're gonna do a PAP. You can do cytology alone for every three years, and it's kind of up to you whether you want to reflex HPV it or not. Um, so her result is we decided not to reflex it. Her result is ASCUS, no HPV reflex. So what are we gonna do? We can now open up our following guidelines. Go back to the other page where it says management. And the first thing you do is say, okay, my phone goes this way, their management goes this way, so the first thing you're gonna do is turn it that way, and then the second thing you're gonna do is enlarge it so that you can read it, and then you're gonna look down the guidelines. So she was 23, she had ASCUS, and this is also true for L low grade. You can just repeat the cytology at 12 months, and they say that's the preferred method. So ask us, you don't have to worry about even if it's HPV positive. If you HPV reflex test it, if it's HPV negative, then you can go back to your three year screen. If it's HPV positive, you're gonna repeat it in a year. So basically what they're saying is ask us or low grade, whether you're HPV positive or negative, you're not doing anything for a year. But if you're just curious if they're HPV positive, you can do an HPV test if you have that extra 15, 20 minutes to talk to her about her HPV. Now, oops, I think, did I go backwards? Okay, I don't know what that was. See, it was that two ham thing. Okay, where we disagree with the guidelines, and I think those of us who do pap smears, especially the older ones of us who do pap smears who are used to doing them every year on the year, oh my God, do the pap. We all feel, or a lot of us feel, that five years is too long. Do you guys feel that five years is too long? Okay, we feel that five years is too long. We also feel uncomfortable just ignoring the ASCUS and the low grade changes in, in the younger women, right? That, that also kind of makes us feel uncomfortable. And most importantly, as I get older, I feel uncomfortable with stopping screening at all. That really worries me. 65, you know, if your life expectancy is 80 and cervical cancer takes about 10 years to progress, if I stop you at 65, am I giving you five years of, you know, we've all seen patients with cervical cancer. It's not really a nice way to live, is it? What, where the patients disagree, well, they want their pap every year. I think we've, we've reconciled every three years, I think. Paps, they want their pap every year. And Medicare, they're not helping because they pay for a pap every two years. So you don't get Medicare until you're 65, mostly. And then they say we're not supposed to pap. And these ladies come in and they're like, Medicare pays, I want my pap. 
And then we all get our, we all get our reports. Did you all get your Medicare report that just came out? Or do you get them, or is that, that must be a national thing. Well, I got it sent to me. I got ripped apart because I'm doing PAPs in people over 65 years of age. So what should I be doing? Should I be refusing them? I don't know. I think that's very hard. If Medicare would stop paying for it, it would make it easier. It's the one thing in the world that Medicare pays for that we wish they didn't. So are we justified? Okay. Are we justified? Let's look at some of the data. And this is where it gets really confusing. And I'm still not sure I understand it, but I'll, I'll show it to you the best I can. Are they justified? I don't think they're justified. I think they, they, the patients, I, I think the Medicare patients, they want what Medicare tells them they could get. So from the Medicare standpoint, they're justified. From the medical standpoint, I'm not so sure. So is, two, is five years too long to wait? Well, the whole management is based on equal management of equal risks. So when you have a PAP result, if you have a normal PAP result, your three, and this is also confusing because some of them do CIN2 or above, and some of them do CIN3 or above. So it's, it was very hard to reconcile some of this. So if you have a normal cytology, your three-year risk of CIN3 or worse is 0.26%. So it is a very low percent. If you have negative co-testing, and again, co-testing means negative cytology, negative HPV, if you jump to the five-year risk, which is what they're using as the reference for the co-testing, your five-year risk of CIN3 or worse is 0.08%, okay? So what they're looking at is what was it that would make us automatically do, before we had HPV testing, right? We would do a colposcopy always on the low-grade SILs, right? The low-grade SILs, their five-year risk of CIN3 or worse, if they're not treated and we don't really treat them anymore, is 5.2%. So they're using 5.2% as their cutoff, if your risk is less than 5.2% of having CIN3 or worse, based on we would normally colposcopy that, then you don't need a colposcopy. So based on that, if we wait five years, the only person who really needs a colposcopy is the ASCUS HPV positive, okay? They're saying if we wait five years in these people, it's really not much different than waiting than seeing a low-grade lesion early on and treating it. We're not getting higher than the low-grade, okay? So somewhere, they've decided that a 5.2% risk of CIN3 or worse is an acceptable risk. Now, I'm not sure 5% is an acceptable risk. Do we do VBACs on vertical incisions? No, why? Or do we induce them? No, why? Because that's when you hit the 5% risk. So we don't take a 5% risk on a uterine rupture, so why are we taking a 5% risk on a cervical cancer? And that, that's where it's hard to reconcile. So again, that's, that's what the logic is based on for the five years. So again, negative co-testing, I don't have a problem with that. Ask us HPV negative, again, 2.6. <coughs> I don't know, that's pretty low risk. So when you think of the number of women, maybe that's acceptable. And then this is where we're gonna start acting. Then, after you've had an abnormal result. So if you have negative co-testing, um, and, and again, five-year risk is 0.68%. Again, completely different risks, right? In, in our last slide, our, our risk was 0.26, I'm sorry, 0.08. And now all of a sudden in this study, our risk is 0.68. So we're still less than 1%, but, and so we're still a pretty low risk. If you have a PAP that has any of these abnormalities, this is your five, untreated, this is your five-year risk of at least CIN2. So your risks are getting really high, even with just your ASCUS HPV positive, okay? If you do your colposcopy on any of these, Again, if we get high-grade stuff, we treat it, right? So that falls into a different category. If we get low-grade or normal, we don't treat it. 
if we don't treat it and wait five years after one abnormal, we've gone up to 10 to 20 percent CIN2 or more, okay? That's why we don't ever wait the five, year, five years um, to repeat those PAPs. So once you have an abnormal PAP, you then have to go back and look at it again the next year. If it's normal, these are your risks. They go from one to two percent. So none of the normals drop back low enough to go to every five-year screening. And I'm saying not enough data to see if more than one negative co-test re reduces that five-year screen risk. The data is probably out there. I can't find it anywhere. So if you look at the ASCCP guideline, if you have CIN1 or less and you repeat it in a year and it's normal, they go back to the routine screening. So I think we have to think about when we have one of these, um, one of, one of these that have a normal colposcopy and we followed it in a year, I think we have to be really careful about that five-year follow-up. And the ASCCP app and even the ASCCP guidelines, and if anybody has another opinion of this, I'm happy to hear it, what I find they do is they send us in, in circles. They get us to two years out, but they don't tell us what to do after those two years. And I think that's where we're probably all doing different things and that's where we need help. Um, and I'll summarize a little bit at the end, but not to beat myself to the punchline, but I think the really important thing is to know the whole PAP history. Somebody comes to you with an HPV, an ASCUS HPV positive, or you do her first PAP and it's ASCUS HPV, even ASCUS HPV negative, you need to know what were the prior PAPs because I think we really have to say this five-year screening probably works really well for somebody who's always been normal HPV negative. But if you have somebody who's had some abnormals in there, you really need to pay attention to it. And that's going to be, you know, we've got a very mobile society, and that's really hard to do, to know their PAP history. And what do people tell you? They either come in and say, I had cervical cancer, right, because everybody who has an abnormal PAP is cancer, or they say, I have an abnormal PAP, and I have no idea what it was. Did, they, did you have any treatment? I'm not really sure. And then you're left with, what's my follow-up? So you really have to remember that the guidelines are guidelines. Um, again, I think that's because I couldn't. So if you have, why is this going backwards? Oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is not going backwards. This is me going backwards, okay. Again, if you look at their algorithm for ASCUS or L low grade in a 21 to 24 year old, this is, again, where we're uncomfortable is not treating it where, again, they said repeat it, in, repeat it in 12 months, and then if it's normal then, repeat it again in 12 months, and if it's normal then, go back to routine screening. So again, the ASCCP is generally tell us to get two normals after any abnormal, because none of them hit that 5.2% five-year risk of the low-grade PAP. And if you look at it by age, this is how they differentiate the 21 to 24-year-olds. Your risk, your five-year risk of CIN3 in the 21 to 24-year-olds, even with H ASCUS HPV positive, is still below that five-year threshold of, that 5.2% threshold of colposcopy we use for the low-grade. <coughs> In 25 to 29, your five-year risk is starting to go up a little bit. In age 30 to 65, your five-year risk of, of CIN2 is now equal to that, is, is where that low-grade risk comes from, right? So remember in the first slide, we only copo people with low-grade, and that's because their risk is 5.2. So somewhere we've decided that 5.2 is the acceptable risk of waiting for a CIN3 or worse to develop. So in your 21 to 24 year olds, you don't hit that risk. In your 25 to 29 year olds, and this is the difference, the ASCUS HPV positives in your 25 to 29 year olds, that's a higher risk. So that's why you're copoing your 25 to 29 year olds 
and you're not copoing your 21-year-olds. Okay? So again, it's hard to follow, but somewhere we've decided it's okay to let 21 to 24-year-olds have a 4.4% chance of a high-risk um, lesion. Now, this was 134,000 women that they looked at. Over the course of the study, there were three cancers. So the three cancers during this, during this non-colposcopy waiting for that next year um, developed cancer. So that's probably less than 4.4, right? So you have three out of 134,000 women. So we, it, it's kind of a, th their percentages don't seem to match up with, with their studies. And this data is really difficult to follow. I tried, I swear I tried. Primary HPV screening, again, this is the algorithm that went away, where you would just get an HPV. If you were 16 or 18 positive, you went right to colposcopy. If you were high risk positive, but it wasn't 16 or 18, you did a reflex cytology. If the cytology was abnormal, you then did the colposcopy. If the cytology was normal, you followed up in 12 months. If your HPV was negative, you followed up in three years. So it's kind of almost the reverse of what we're doing now with our PAPS first. That is only recommended, again, by ASCCP and um, SGO. It's not recommended yet by ACOG. Is anybody doing that, primary HPV testing? I, I don't think many people are doing it. I think the guidelines, um, I, I think we're waiting for ACOG to give us more advice on that. And again, only after age 25. So the one thing that I do like about this is that they, they are treating the 25-year-olds different than the 21-year-olds, okay? For 21, what they're saying is just do PAPS. Don't bother with the HPV. It has a higher rate of detection of CIN2 or greater than cytology alone. The problem with primary HPV screening is we know that there are some cervical cancers what is it, somewhere between 2 4% that are H independent of HPV, as far as we know, we're going to completely miss the non-HPV-related cervical cancers until they present with symptoms, and we may be seeing them at a, at a later um, stage. So there's still a lot of development stuff going on with the pap smears. What about the reflex 16, 18? And I'm adding 45 in there. And that's also one of the pitfalls of these guidelines is that HPV 45 is coming out to be almost as bad as 16, 18 in some of the literature. And we're kind of ignoring 45 in a lot of those other guidelines. So what is reflex HPV? Reflex HPV is if you get a cytology normal HPV positive, instead of waiting that year to repeat it, you can get a 16 and 18 reflex if it's, it's high risk positive. 16, 18, our lab automatically does a 45 as well, so we treat 45 the same. So if it's positive, you go to immediate colposcopy. If it's negative, you go to a one-year co-test, okay? That's pretty straightforward. What happens if you do your immediate colposcopy, your colposcopy is normal, you check it again next year, you reflex it, it's still 16, 8 positive. Do you do another COPO? Are we doing COPOs every single year on 16, 18 positives? Yes, no, yes. When the patient comes back after four or five years of colposcopy and says, I don't want to come back and do this anymore? I mean, that's where the guidelines, some people interpret the guidelines as once you've done your COPO and your COPO's normal, and you get your positive HPV with a normal cytology, you've now reset to the, to the new one. And they're not really clear about that. The other question that I think we all have is you have your cytology normal HPV positive, and you do it again the next year, and your HPV is still not 16, 18, 45. Technically, you can just keep screening those people every three years, and I'm not sure we're very comfortable with that either. So any one of these algorithms has pitfalls. So again, 
Right now, it's interpreted as 16, 18 positive, culp every year. 16, 18 negative, culp never. I don't know that I'm crazy about culp never. How about stopping at 65? The recommendations are, if they've had three consecutive negative cytologies, two consecutive negative co-tests, within the last 10 years, with the most recent one being within five years. How many people can figure that out from their chart within a 15-minute appointment? And no CIN2 or worse for 20 years. Okay, so that, that's a lot of expectations and, and records and um, investigation to decide whether or not to do a PAP. That's why you will see me every year on the Medicare, you know, bad girl list for doing PAPs. What they say, though, if you do a PAP every five years from ages 69 to 95, we are basically going to give people less than one year of life of improvement in longevity. So we're not going to really extend your life. We may make it a little bit more miserable because you're going to have cervical cancer, but you're still going to kind of die around the same age. The argument is it increases the potential harms from the biopsies, colposcopies, and incisional procedures. And yes, I think that that is true. We all know that there's a risk and benefit. Um, uh, when we look at up to date, up to date in terms of, and I know up to date is expert opinion, so we know it's just expert opinion and not evidence based, but sometimes expert opinions come from the people who are sitting there looking at the patient. So they say look at the risk factors. Are they smoking? Do you not know their history? Have they had at any time in their life previous HPV related disease? And the other thing is Medicare won't pay for an HPV. <coughs> So now we're back to cytology alone. Have they had new partners? Are they immunocompromised? The DES exposure is kind of get going away as we get older. And what they say, which I think is a very practical thing, if they have no, well, what they say is if there's risk factors, you should continue to screen them. And what they're saying is if they have a life expectancy greater than 10 years, which most 65-year-olds do, if everything is negative, then it's really uncertain when you should stop screening them. I think, and this is what they say for the mammogram, because when they look at when do you stop mammograms, a lot of the guidelines say, and we'll go over that in a minute, is if somebody has, is expected to have a healthy next 10 years of life, then it's probably worth screening them, because then you can do some intervention. and. Even though you may not be incre increasing the longevity of their life, you may actually be incre increasing their quality of life. And that's the expert opinion. So again, that's a little bit off the guidelines, but I think, you know, it used to be easy. We did a PAP every year, we didn't think about it, we got a result, you know, we would decrease cervical cancer tremendously, and now it's so complicated to just do a pap smear. So you can't just do a pap smear, I think you really have to think about it and you really have to know the results. I can't do the left hand thing. ACOG says once you stop screening, don't ever start, start screening again for any reason. So if somebody gets a new partner, if somebody, anything changes, you don't, st you don't ever start screening again. Okay? Again, the difference is if they have symptoms, right? Remember, you, a, a pap smear becomes a diagnostic test if somebody has something, has symptoms. So it's okay to pap somebody with symptoms, but ACOG says once you stop at 65, if they come back in at 75 and say, I haven't been here for 10 years, I want my pap smear, I really want my pap smear, ACOG says no. I think most of us say yes. Medicare still says yes, but ACOG says no. So what can we conclude from all this craziness? Not before 21 sounds really reasonable, right? Because we're doing more harm than good before 21. Don't overpap people. Don't overdiagnose people. Don't overtreat people. Really stick to the don't treat the low grade lesions. Just follow the low grade lesions. Be sure to know your pap history. You really need to have good charting for that. I don't know about your EMRs, but my EMR does a horrible job of that. 
In order to find a PAP, I have to go into my lab and I have to pull back every year to find a PAP. I actually just, probably a month ago because I was getting so crazy, I actually printed out the PAP flow sheet that we used to use in the paper chart. And what I'm doing, all it is, is it's, two co it's three columns, date, procedure, result. And I hand write in, in 2014, she had HPV positive, we did a CULP, it was negative. In 2016, she had a PAP that was low grade, we did a CULP, it was CIN1. And then I initial it, and then when I go, then I screen it, I have them um, scan it in. And when they come back for their next PAP or their CULPO or I get CULPO results, I print it out, I add the new things in, I sign it on that line, and I screen it again. It's a ridiculous way to do medical records when you have a computer that I'm sure can do it, but that's what I'm doing now, and I think it's really important to be able to pull something out and know their PAP history. And have a good follow-up procedure. Send recalls. Don't let people miss their PAPs. If they need to come back, they need to come back and you have to remind them. And I say aim to stop the PAPs at age 65, but use clinical judgment. I think in everything we have to use clinical judgment. And get the app, it really is helpful. The other thing I didn't, do, do you guys use the app? Yes? The other thing that's really helpful on the app is when you can put in the specific patient where they ask for the patient's age, the PAP result, HPV status, then you could put in the result from the colposcopy, the result from the PAP, and it'll keep giving you the next step. It's helpful. It still does give you all those choices, so you still have to think about it a little bit. Anybody else? Anybody have any comments on the whole PAP thing? That's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, again, I think that, you know, 65, you know, 65 is the new 50. So why are we telling people after 65 it's okay? And, and again, uh, the statistics say about longevity, I don't know that they're looking at quality, and it's really hard to tease through this literature. I really, cr I really tried. I almost said I really cried. I almost really cried. But it's just numbers, numbers, numbers and nothing correlates with anything. And I'm like, where did they come up with this? They, they need to put in a simple document. This is why we say this. But I couldn't find that simple document. If you can, send it to me. Yes? That you screen them according to guidelines. Okay, is that not their guideline? The guideline is repeated in here. It's still HPV positive and positive. Okay, even without reflex. You co test. Well, but, but even, I'm sorry, but even without reflexing to 16, 18. Okay, well, I uh, thank you for that correction. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's hard to interpret them, but thank you for that. I must have overlooked that when I was looking through it. Which is what we do anyway, because if they're HPV positive, we're not even reflexing 16, 18, and our lab does not do it unless we ask them to do it. I'm sorry. Well, uh, again, what we know is that most young sexually active um, women or women and men have been exposed to HPV. Warts are low grade HPV, so they're not going to be associated with the cervical disease. So the answer to that would still be no, I wouldn't do a PAB because the likelihood that I would find a positive HPV is high. The likelihood that she would have significant disease or would not clear the HPV is very low. 
So that's why the whole recommendation about not papping before 21, and the reason you don't pap before 21 is because so many people are positive and they will tend to clear it, even the higher lesions. And again, in, in, the, in the guidelines, even the CIN2s, um, you can be following in the younger population and not necessarily treating. Okay, mammograms. I don't have a quote of the day, that's my picture of the day. I do have a quote of the day, but it's a serious one, so I thought I'd put a fun picture in. I hope I did not offend anybody by that picture. I thought we could take it. Okay, mammogram guidelines. Looking at the ACOG, the US Preventative Task Force, the American Cancer Society, and I cannot remember what NCCN stands for, National Center for Cancer, thank you, Cancer Network. Okay, they are, they all have little bit different guidelines. From the simple thing of breast exam, ACOG says every one to three, US says insufficient evidence for or against, American Cancer Society says don't bother, NCCN says we should do it at least starting at 35 and annually at age 40. I think most of us still do breast exams and I think we probably should. Initial mammogram, offer start at 40 from ACOG. So again, offer start at 40. Age 49, 40 to 49 after counseling, recommend no later than 50. So ACOG gives us a little bit of leeway, okay? ACOG is always a little bit wishy-washy. I think they're kind of that way on purpose because they give us a little bit of leeway. The, the task force says, nope, not till 50. The American Cancer Society says, offer from 40 to 45, recommend it um, starting at 45. And then the cancer, the NCCN says, recommend at 40. So the only one who still says actually recommend at 40 is the NCCN. Everybody else says kind of, you know, start to offer, start to talk about, you know, see if they should have it or not. Screening interval every one to two years for ACOG, every two years, annual 40 to 54, and every two years 55 and above, um, or annually. Again, age 75 stop, but individualize afterwards. Insufficient evidence to assess benefits or benefit versus harm after age 75, which helps us not at all. This one, I think, again, life expectancy is less than 10 years, then you should probably not do mammograms anymore. And again, NCCN says the same thing. If you have somebody who has other major comorbidities who looks like they have a, um, a, a life expectancy less than 10 years, then you don't have to do mammograms anymore. So the differences are when to start, 40, 45, 50. Okay, so what are we saying? Well, effectiveness. Are we effective at, de at detecting cancer? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to detect cancer and decrease mortality. We're also trying to avoid false positives, benign procedures, anxiety, cost, and overdiagnosis. Okay, overdiagnosis means like the DCIS that we're treating as cancer but may not really be something that always, that progresses um, all the time. So if we look at age 40, okay? So at age 40, your incidence of cancer is about 150 per 100,000 women. If you look at age 50, you've kind of jumped up to between 200 and 250 per, 200, per 100,000 women. So, Again, low incidence in a young population. The problem is we're missing those people in between. And the people who are premenopausal who get cancer tend to get the more aggressive cancers. So it's hard to, to make that decision. So let's look at do we really help the women between 39 and 49 in terms of decreased mortality. Well, if we do mammograms on everybody during that time, we prevent three deaths per 10,000 women over 10 years. So we're not doing a heck of a lot to decrease mortality. 
And the same if we're doing it between 29, 50 to 69 year olds, we are decreasing by 29 to 33%, and we're decreasing by eight per 10,000 over 10 years. Not statistically, this is not statistically significant, not between each other. It's not statistically significant, again, for people to be dead versus non-dead in that study. So they're saying there's no statistical difference in how many women are dying versus not dying if you do mammograms or not. The observational studies, it's different. They say that they show the decreased mortality of 33 to 44% in the ages of 39 to 49, which is just as good, if not better, than the people 50 to 69. And it's probably better because you're adding these two together, right? So that's still a fairly significant decreased mortality. Detection of cancer, are we detecting, and again, the way they put these statistics is very confusing. There's no decrease in the diagnosis of advanced breast cancer if we screen from age 39 to 49 or if we stop, start at 50. So what they're saying is between the ages of 39 and 49, we're picking up the, the very early cancers exactly opposite of what I said. What did I just say? I said the younger women tend to have the more aggressive cancers. They're saying, no, that's not really true. If we stop screening in the young women, we're not finding that we're getting less aggressive cancers if we start screening older. So they're saying that clinically we're picking up the aggressive cancers in the younger women, and it's not the screening that's doing it. The problem is the overdiagnosis that through screening, we're picking up cancers that would not have become clinically evident without screening. So there are randomized clinical trials that say that 19% of women diagnosed with breast cancer as a result of screening may be overdiagnosed. Again, we're picking up those very early DCISs that may not ever progress into cancers. So if we weren't looking for them early, they may actually, just like some of your CINs go away on your cervix, some of these DCISs could go away. We're picking them up early. We're picking up 19% of women, 19% more than we might have to be picking up. The problem is 100% of them will be treated. So they're saying for every woman who avoids death from breast cancer through screening, we have two to three people who are going through treatment for unnecessary cancers. Again, I don't think treating two or three to save one seems like such a great number. Younger age is associated with that higher overdiagnosis. So what they're saying is that we are treating too many people, we're biopsying too many people, and in the long run, we're not really saving that many people. So it's not a matter of diagnosis, it's a matter of mortality. And this is the table that shows the estimated effects, uh, estimates of benefits and harms of mammograms for 10,000 women screened yearly for 10 years. So diagnosis with invasive breast cancer, again, at 4147, up to 231, up to 345. So you're picking up higher numbers. The breast cancer deaths are also going up with age. The deaths averted because a mammogram, again, three in the 40-year-olds, 10 in the 50-year-olds, 43 in the 60-year-olds. I mean, from this, it looks like we're not doing a heck of a lot with screening anybody, are we? And my favorite quote of this lecture, again, it's not a happy quote, is the likelihood that a woman with average risk will experience harm from mammogram screening is consistently higher than the likelihood that she will benefit. So we have to think about that and think about all the mammograms we do, the recalls, the biopsies, the six, you know, the, all the things that women go through during the mammograms. The lifetime risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer, not the risk of dying from breast cancer, um, is your low risk if your lifetime risk of diagnosis is less than 15, moderate risk if diagnosis is 15 to 20, high risk if it's greater than 20. American Cancer Society defines low risk as no personal history, no suspected genetic mutation, 
no history of previous radiotherapy. So there, that makes a lot of people low risk. It makes the vast majority of people low risk. And you, there's gotta be more to it than that. High risk, they say, if you have a significant family history, prior diagnosis of proliferative, benign proliferative breast disease. Again, how are we getting that prior diagnosis of benign proliferative breast disease if we're not doing mammograms? Not sure or significant mammographic breast density. So if we're basing our high risk factors on our mammogram findings and they're telling us to do less mammograms, it becomes very hard to stratify our high risk from our low risk patients. These are the other, these are the relative risks of breast cancer. So you can look, the highest risk comes from, look at that, extremely dense breast has the highest relative risk of breast um, breast cancer, diagnosis, not death. Chest radiation, I'm sorry, chest radiation is the highest, extremely dense, dense breast is the highest clinical one. How many people see extremely dense breast on most of the mammograms that they send out? It, it's an incredibly high number. Biopsy with atypical hyperplasia is not even as high as dense breasts. So you can look down these lists of breast, um, risk factors, and that's how you should, that is gonna be the argument of how you should be deciding who should get mammograms. Again, we talked about the Gale model yesterday. The Gale mo model does not take into account dense breasts, right? So we can use that and have our low risk, less than 15% of a lifetime, but in this model, we're not taking into account what we just identified as the highest risk factor. This app, if we do use it, and it is a quick one to use, what I like about this app is that it will give you your five-year risk compared to the average risk of a woman of the same age. But what I really like of it is it also will say your risk of not getting breast cancer is 99.3%. I think we focus so much on telling people their risks of having a disease. That's why all, all the women are walking around worried about breast cancer, because all we're doing is saying, well, one in eight women get breast cancer. Maybe we should start saying, you know, seven out of eight women don't. Because during breast cancer month, October, you know, pink out for breast cancer, is every woman in the room three times as afraid of breast cancer during the month of October? Every woman in the world, everywhere you turn, you see a pink ribbon. Even my mother, who had breast cancer, hates October. She said, because I feel like a survivor until October, when all I could think about is the cancer that I had. And then again, you can see that your five-year risk might be changed when you look at the whole lifetime risk. Again, this is diagnosis of breast cancer and not dying from breast cancer. There are a lot of other screening tools that we probably should be thinking about, and they all have kind of plus and minuses. The NCI breast cancer tool is less accurate for women with a strong family history or women over 70, and again, does not put dense breasts in there. The Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium stresses the importance of age and dense breasts and includes it in their calculation. There's the Ontario Family History Assessment Tool. There's a ton of assessment tools out of there. Um, these last ones are useful for women who have a family history of breast cancer, but they don't account for dense breasts. So you have to, we need a new screening tool. Remember we were talking about that for cardiac? We need a new breast cancer screening tool, one that's gonna do a better job for us. I talked to my breast surgeons and they said that they are still using the Gale and then they're factoring in the dense breasts um, in terms of interpretation. What is emphasized now, because again, our mammogram screening guidelines are all over the place, is shared decision making. When we look at shared decision making versus age-related screening, uh, you help the patient make an informed value-based decision. You review the risks and benefits. You explore any individual risks of the patient. Um, and then there are published decision aids, leaflets, booklets, videos, websites, where you can actually print out and have the women read through the risks and benefits. Okay, that's because we have, you know, amazing amount of time to spend with these patients. What's interesting, this 
this is not working. That JAMA says, if you talk about the risks and benefits and you share decision making, that most women are more likely to decline having screening. ACOG says they're more likely to accept having screening. I don't know where that leaves us. Dense breasts, okay. How, what are people doing on dense breasts? Are people sending everybody for ultrasounds when they come back with dense breasts? Yes? No. Good, we're not either. We decided we're gonna ignore the dense breast thing. Is it printed on your mammogram reports? Okay, I didn't know if that was a New Jersey thing or a national thing. But everybody comes in concerned about their dense breasts. And the interesting is the data shows that if you have extremely dense breasts, a 3D mammogram is more effective than an ultrasound. It has an increased breast detention um, breast cancer detection rate and a lower false positive rate. So rather than if you have a patient who comes in and says I want something done, they're better to have a 3D mammogram than they are to have an ultrasound. We all know that ultrasounds are better when we're feeling something and there's something to target. As a screening test, ultrasounds are not um, very good. Ultrasound in this situation does not decrease breast cancer mortality. And in low-risk women, the digital mammogram for high density without additional testing um, is fine. So this is what we're following in our low-risk women with extremely dense breasts. We're not recommending they do anything else. If they talk to me about it, you know, the problem is they don't usually have their mammogram before they see you, right? They see you, you give them a mammogram script, then they get the mammogram and then they call you because they have an abnormal mammogram. So now do you send them back? Do you bring them in and talk to them again? What I usually tell people is that if you have extremely dense breasts and you're low risk, the next year when you have your mammogram, consider doing a 3D mammogram with it. Don't go back and do another mammogram. What are the pros and cons of a 3D mammogram? Well, the pro is it's a better test. What are the cons? It's higher radiation, but it's still within the standard of radiation from a mammogram. The other con about it right now is that insurance is not always paying for it. So you have to tell the patient the insurance may or may not pay for it. Most of the insurances are starting to pick it up. And in our offices, um, in our radiology groups, the 3D mammogram is only adding an additional 65 to $90 to the patient. So if you tell them it's only a 65 to $90 test for most people, they'll do it, other people can call their insurance beforehand. And our medic, we see a lot of Medicaid, Medicaid HMOs, and, and our Medicaid um, HMOs at least are, are picking up um, the, the $65. When to stop screening, again, age 75, interesting, you hit the age of 75 and the incidence of breast cancer starts dropping off. So that is the rationale for stopping at 75. Again, good estimate, look at their life expectancy. If you have more than a 10 year life expectancy, um, then you, and you don't have significant comorbidities, you can continue to screen. If people ask me to continue to screen, I continue to screen them. If they ask me what my opinion is, I go over the pros and cons. Conclusion, the screen, screening strategies differ based on the estimated risk of breast cancer. So you have to look at the woman individually. Women should be informed of both the benefits and the risks. There should be shared decision making. Studies show that it adds 2.6 minutes to your appointment time. Major risk factors certainly deserve more attention. Family history is really important. Improvement, interestingly, improvement in survival from breast cancer is not really over the last 50 years improvement has survival has improved tremendously and the feeling is that it's not really due to our screening it's really due to the improvement in treatments so i think if you're going any one of these recommendations i think as long as people are getting their mammograms breast cancer for the most part is a slowly growing cancer i think if you're doing one year or two years if you're looking at the risks, I think as long as we're doing something with our women and they're getting their mammograms, 
at least that every couple years, I still think we're doing a good job. I think we stress a lot about it. Um, I have women who don't ever have mammograms because they don't want to have mammograms. It's okay, it's their breasts. They don't want to have mammograms, they don't have to have mammograms. I even have women on hormone therapy who don't get mammograms. Ovarian cancer, again, so now September is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Um, listen carefully, it whispers is, is there kind of ovarian cancer, I don't know if motto sounds too happy, but kind of they're saying. Um, and ovarian cancer s scares us all to death. We should all be more afraid of ovarian cancer as women than, than breast cancer. In 2018, just in April, the U.S. task force again reinforced that we should not be screening, that there is no effective screening test for ovarian cancer, and we should not be screening for ovarian cancer. It is the second most common cancer of the female re reproductive system. More women die from ovarian cancer than from uterine and cervical combined. But why can't we screen for it? What are the problems? There's, it's still a low prevalence disease. High false positives lead to lots of unnecessary interventions, which are usually surgical. And the ability to detect the, at an early stage is really small. You can have a normal ultrasound and six months later have a very high grade, um, high stage ovarian cancer. The screening modalities that we do have right now, CA125 and some of the other tumor markers, transvaginal ultrasound, or the multimodal, which is CA125 plus transvaginal. Meta-analysis of three major trials, 300,000 women looking at mortality. Average risk women over the age of 45, they looked at all three of those modalities, transvaginal alone, both or CA125, found no change in mortality of ovarian cancer. And again, 300,000 women, they didn't change mortality. Screening led to surgery in about 1% of women who were screened with CA125 and about 3% of women with transvaginal ultrasound, which kind of makes sense. We always see ovaries are active organs, right? Where are we seeing something on the ovary? Major complications in that surgical, 3 to 15%. So we were not changing mortality. We were hurting a lot more women than we were actually helping. So how can we help? Identify high-risk women. Again, family history, really important. Educate all women and educate ourselves to really recognize symptoms. And then do things that we can to help women lower their risk. Pelvic exam, not effective screening for ovarian cancer. I, I think anybody who does pelvic exams agrees with that, right? How many people have diagnosed an ovarian cancer on a pelvic exam? In 25 years, I've diagnosed one. Have you done significant? I mean, and I didn't even, I thought it was just an ovary. So how do we identify at-risk uh, women? Oh, there's the NCCN. Um, there are lots of, I'm not gonna read through these, you guys can all look these up. Close relatives, again, no mutation, more than two primaries in a single, more than two breast cancer <coughs> primaries in a single, Two individuals, again, male breast cancer, that's a real trigger for you. If anybody has a, family a male family member with male breast cancer, that should be an automatic trigger for high risk for, um, for genes. First or second degree with a cancer less than 45. Family history of three or more of the following, pancreatic, breast, prostate, all of these. That's a lot of, that's a lot of different cancers that all run together. Basically, anybody with a family history with a lot of those, you know, we all talk to those patients who everybody has some kind of cancer. Up to date, again, I, I know I refer up to date in their committee opinion, but I think uh, their expert opinion, but I think we go to them as a quick reference very frequently, and they are updated very, very often, which, which is very helpful. They have different, for non-Jewish families, these are there. Again, I'm not going to read them. You can find that reference and follow it yourself. Really good to have a printout of this in your office for when you're doing histories and you come out and say, mm, is this somebody I should refer or not? You can kind of look at that. In Jewish families, because they have a higher, much higher incidence of carrying the BRCA genes, 
they need less, there's less of a trigger for you to think about hereditary breast cancer syndromes in them and have them tested. So what happens when you identify? I, I, some of you I know probably work in much more rural areas than I work in. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. But when I identify somebody at risk, I don't send a BRCA test. I refer them immediately to genetics. And I have genetics do a family history, a very detailed family history, because there's a lot more genes than the BRCA genes. And I think I'm doing somebody a disservice by doing BRCA and then saying, okay, you're BRCA negative. And I think that puts them in a lower, I want to reassure them, but I don't want to falsely reassure them either. So how do we educate all women? What are the symptoms? Oh, see, this whole pointer thing is killing me. More than 12 days per month of less than 12 month duration, okay? Any of this abdominal pain, abdominal, any kind of vague symptoms, vague GI symptoms, vague abdominal symptoms, we know that. Um, acute onset, if somebody has been having abdominal pain their entire life, you don't necessarily have to do an ultrasound every year, but you need to talk to them about changes in symptoms are important to, identify, to bring to your attention so that you can investigate it. Vast majority of women with these symptoms are not going to have ovarian cancer, but they should be screened at least with transvaginal. Actually, with transvaginal is much more effective than doing any single blood test. And we want a lower risk for all women, right? How can we do that? Combined oral contraceptives. This is where some of the LARC methods are doing us a disservice. They're really great for preventing pregnancy, but they're not really preventing a lot of the other um, problems that, uh, that oral contraceptives help prevent and cure. Uh, combined oral contraceptives, protective effects last up to 30 years. And that's, that's really remarkable. And the relative risk is 0.73. So you have almost a 30% decrease risk on combined oral contraceptives. For people who are high risk, because of family histories, they should be on oral contraceptives. Uh, Dr. Merjanian talked a little bit about doing salpingectomies instead of just tying tubes, um, or you know, instead of doing tubules, take out the entire tube. Again, 35 to 65 percent risk reduction in just population-based studies. These are not high-risk women. These are low-risk women. So we really, if we do a prophylactic um, salpingectomy, we are really helping decrease ovarian cancer. And right now, that's probably about the best we can do. So as I was saying before, we have at our Rutgers Cancer Institute, I have the Project HOPE. They are the Hereditary Oncology Prevention and Education Program. They're wonderful. When I see a person who has these family history that I'm not sure or I am really sure they need to be tested, I refer them to Project HOPE. And that's great because I don't always feel qualified to do the counseling and tell them the recommendations and go over the risks, and the genetic counselors do, right? So what's the problem we have now? Oh, 23 and me. Do you know that they do a full cancer profile on these? You can order them with or without BRCA testing, Lynch testing, um, Parkinson's testing, any genetic test, you can send your DNA and they will send you a letter back going, oh, guess what? You have a 65% chance of having breast cancer. And then people come into your office hysterical, right? So you need to know how to at least talk about it. One to 300 and one to 800 women carry BRCA1 or BRCA2. And you can see the risks. No mutation. The risk of ovarian cancer is actually pretty small, 1.5%. If you look at BRCA1 and BRCA2, tremendous risks of, of ovarian cancer, very, very tremendous, very high risks of breast cancer as well. So you tell them that, that's not very good counseling and reassurance, is it? So what do you, how do you counsel? Well, talk to them about risk reduction. What are the screenings they should do? What are the risk reduction agents? And even with this combined contraceptive craziness about breast cancer, the increased risk of breast cancer still significantly outweighs the decreased risk of ovarian cancer in these young people. So you should still be putting them on the pill and not worrying about the breast cancer. 
Surgical risk reduction, the bilateral salpingu-forectomy. How about just doing a salpingectomy if they want to keep their, their uterus? Are we, are we helping them if we do that? Need to talk to them about fertility issues. These are people who should probably not wait till the age of 40 to start thinking about having kids. You may talk to them about um, egg freezing. Long-term health issues, that's gonna come up too. Okay, we can protect you from having ovarian cancer, but now you have early menopause. You can have sexual function issues, cardiovascular and bone implications over your life. Insurance issues. What's going to happen now that you know, you're not supposed to have any problems with pre-existing conditions, and, but I'm not so sure the genetic conditions are as protected as, as we think they are. Physiologic impact, uh, psychologic impact. What's going to happen when I have my breasts off? Why do I have to have my ovaries out? I'm depressed. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in terror over dying. Should I even have children? Why is it fair to pass this along? And the one that I forgot to add on there is your family members. What happens now when one family member gets tested? What happens to all the other family members? Whose responsibility is that to talk to those other family members? So you need to cover all that a little bit. This is why I like to have the specialists do it. They do it all the time. They're good at doing it. Just like being able to have psych and, you know, counseling, you can't always get to genetic counselors, so you have to do it, some of it yourself. What are the screening guidelines for ACOG for BRCA positive? Age 25 to 29, a breast exam every six to 12 months. Okay, these are women that you should encourage self-breast exams. Annual radiologic screen. In the age of 25 to 29, they should be getting annual MRIs with contrast. Don't start the mammograms that young. Why? Remember the chest radiation risk of breast cancer? We don't want to start doing mammograms. We don't want to start doing mammograms and increasing their radiation that young. Over th and for the ovary, no screening at that young age. Don't have to screen. Age over 30, annual mammogram, annual MRI with contrast, and again, you usually alternate them every six months, annual breast exam. For the ovary, CA125 every four to six months, an ultrasound every year, not shown to decrease mortality, but showed earlier stages of diagnosis versus no screening in at least one fairly large study, so it's still recommended to do. Combined, uh, we can offer risk-reducing agents. Again, we talked about combined oral contraceptives. Haven't been shown to change the risk of breast cancer. Tamoxifen, BRCA1 doesn't have a whole lot of um, effect on ovarian cancer. Breast cancer, the BRCA1, again, that's the more aggressive gene. BRCA1 is the worst gene. They tend to be the triple negative breast cancers. Oh, which is why tamoxifen doesn't help. But in BRCA2, you can get a 62% decrease. Raloxifen is not good, as good as tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, limited data. <coughs> Surgical risk reduction, again, salpingophorectomy, BRCA1, 35 to 40, BRCA2, 40 to 45. Earlier intervention is better in terms of breast protection because you're getting rid of the estrogen. Probably better to have your bilateral mastectomy so that when you have your oophorectomy, you can take estrogen replacement and eliminate the other issues. Long-term health issues, hormotherapy, again, not contraindicated. If they have no breast cancer or if they've had their mastectomy, vaginal dryness and sexual issues, moisturizers, lubricants, locally applied estrogen, DHEA is now having a study, or they're initiating a study of DHEA in women with a history of breast cancer. Phlebanserin, we talked about the pros and cons. Future possibilities, every couple year we get, a, we get a panel, right, where we can check 16 or 17 or 18 or 30 different markers in the blood and talk about risk. None of them have been shown to work. I'm putting a picture of a dog up. Before I get to the dog, there is one other there is one other on the horizon picking up the um, 
from the vagina doing a screening test on vaginal DNA to pick up ovarian cancer. That's in the very early stages. And the dog, they are actually training dogs to smell ovarian cancer. And what they do, I thought this was very interesting, what they do is they take, um, they take blood from women with ovarian cancer and women without ovarian cancer. And they, the dogs are trained so that they can pick up the scent of the blood that has the ovarian cancer. What they're trying to do is not have people, you know, we're like, are we gonna have dogs in the office smelling all of our patients? <laughs> no. Although, if it worked, we would do it. Um, what they're trying to do is identify exactly what it is the dogs are smelling. And if they can identify exactly what the dogs are smelling, then they might be able to make a detection test to it. And there, I finished on time. Two minutes to go. Don't ask me a lot of questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, there was some information I saw a couple years ago about increased incidence of breast cancer with triphasic pills as opposed to monophasic. Any comments? I did not see a difference between. Has anybody else I did seen not, that? Anybody see that? So the question was, are the tri has anybody seen the data that the triphasic pills are worse than the monophasics in terms of breast cancer risk? And the answer basically was, we don't know. We don't think so. We had one comment that there was a recent update that said that even the low-risk pills had the same risk. But remember, the risk is low. Anybody else? Questions? Just a comment, if um, people are not aware, there's a fantastic support group for BRCA positive patients. Um, the initials are, it's FORCE, F-O-R-C-E, Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. So there's a lot of guilt associated with positive testing and the need to notify family members, and they're a it's a national organization, and it's a, a very good um, source to give your patients when they're going for testing. Thank you. That's very helpful because these, these women, um, it, it's a tough thing. <laughs>